Hey, uh, good morning. Uh, You're live. Jihad, can you see us? Uh, unfortunately, I can see you. Uh, the rest of you I know, guys I know we're looking better. good. <laughs> good morning. Uh, George, listen, we well, well, yeah, listen, Jihad, welcome to, uh, from North Carolina. Have a great team here with us today from Rex Hospital. I've got Ravis Sutcher here on the right, one of my there colleagues is. in the practice. Jill's one of our chief techs. Heather's in the back here, one of our chief nurses. I wanted to say thanks to CSI and Cook for uh, funding this, Rex Hospital for uh, allowing us to do this, and all the support from Cook, uh, Penumbra, I see back there, CSI's here as well. So, Jihad, we have a great case today. Um, this is an 89-year-old gentleman with a history of high blood pressure, um, a history of renal insufficiency. In fact, his kidney function today is about 2.5, is creatinine, um, who presented to me a couple weeks ago because he has a wound on the lateral aspect of his foot, the anterior tibial distribution. Um, brought him in last week, did some scalp films, staged it because of his renal insufficiency. So if we could go to the uh, scalp films, as you can see here, this is the abdominal aortogram. He's got relatively normal renals, probably about 30% stenosis at level of the distal aorta. His common iliacs, internal iliacs, and external iliacs are widely patent. Can we go to the next slide? His common femoral arteries and profundas, I tell you, are intact, as well as his proximal SFA. When we get down to the mid-distal SFA on the left lower extremity where the issue is, he has a chronic total occlusion. I will tell you that you can see the railroad type sign uh, with no dye in, uh, in terms of the medial calcium that outlines the vessel. Next slide, please. We get down to the popliteal, it's widely patent. We get into the TP trunk on the left lower extremity, I think everyone can appreciate. There's probably a 70 to 80% stenosis supplying the perineal. The AT is occluded proximally. The PT is occluded. We can't see it. It's at its ostium. Next, uh, next slide, please. And then this shows that the perineal goes down to the level of the ankle and the AT reconstitutes distally by the anterior communicating branch off the perineal. So now we'll go um, to where we are currently. What I've done, Jihad, um, just to take you through this, is that with every access we use, if, if you could point on my hand real quick, um, can you see this? So we use a micropuncture needle for every access. It, that would be common femoral, radial, ulnar, brachial, popliteal, posterior tibial, anterior tibial, or perineal. The wire we typically use is called a knit view wire. The reason I use this knit view wire is because it has a preformed tip it has an 80 centimeter length. It is, it is night and all, so that when you go in, you get good tactile sensation and it won't kink on you. Um, it also gives you a long length so you don't worry about losing the wire in the body. Um, what we've done here is that we've accessed the right common femoral artery. We have a six by 45 centimeter ansel sheath to the level of the left common femoral artery. Um, I have uh, used a run-through wire, gone down to the cap, and have gotten a um, 018, 150-centimeter CXC catheter uh, in place. And that's where we're going to start. So, Jihad, um, we are going to use to cross this a 18-gram um, Cook CTO wire. I would imagine this is a calcified lesion. It's about 60 centimeters in length. Um, but the nice thing about this is that it's a cool tip wire, gives me good tactile sensation. This is my workhorse wire for crossing CTOs. Comments? So George, George, you said 18 gram tip approach wire. It is. It is an 18 gram, 014, 300 centimeter length um, Cook CTO wire. Yes, sir. So George, I'm, I'm going to mention to the audience here and the discussion that we've had about the study that was published a couple years ago when you take a, um, a, let's say, one gram tip wire to a CTO segment, and you put a catheter right behind it, that the tip of the wire uh, increases by four folds. Um, and I'm sure that you're going to have a support catheter behind your 18 gram yeah, wire. So this is probably, you're talking about an 80 gram tip wire by the time you have the support behind it. Uh, is that your thought process to why you started with 18? Absolutely, Jihad. And let's talk about that for a second. So it's a really good point. So if you go through my decision tree on terms of wires that I use, and, I, and as you know, I have a fetish with wires. 
um, is that usually I start with an, I always start with an 014 platform. The reason why is it doesn't limit my device use. I can use every device in the lab. I use an 18 gram tip because it gives me good support and good tactile sensation. If this does not work, then I'll go to a polymer coated jacket wire, usually an 18 gram victory. If that doesn't work, I'll step up the process, go to an 018 platform, 30 gram tip wire, which is an Estado. If that doesn't work, I'll usually go to my 60 gram wire, which is the back end of the Estado. And if that doesn't work, you can all of a sudden it for bypass surgery. No, we'll just reverse the access and, work and go through the other way. I'm going to start working on this lesion. I'm being conscientious of the kidney function, so I'm just looking at the, um, the railroad and just see if I can work through it um, nice and slow. George, it's uh, Lawrence Garcia. But, uh, question for you. Just in, in, as people try to look at this, you have an 89-year-old with a creatinine of two and a half. So, I mean, his, just on the cockcroft galt uh, equation, his creatinine clearance is in the probably low 20s, if not in the teens. Why, why, shoot okay, the aorta, Larry, I, why shoot the aortogram as opposed to just doing pressure gradients and setting them up? Why not use CO2 for the upstream segments and then just do low, low contrast for the distal segments? Um, you know, that's a great, great um, point. And Larry, you bring that up is because the CO2, you don't get good visualization. Hey, Jihai, I just wanted to show you this. It took me, I think, four seconds to cross that CTO. I know you're timing me. But um, just going back, um, be again, humble, that's a George, great... Be humble, It's yeah. early in the morning. Make, make it look difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but George, I, I, I give you a lot of credit for your selection. So, you know, actually, Dr. Adam took the time to select the proper catheter wire combination uh, so having a catheter behind the 18 gram tip wire that gives them a significant increase in the gram tip and the torqueability that this wire provides is phenomenal. For those of you that are not approach, uh, familiar with the approach wire, it is a wire that you should have in your, in your uh, operating rooms or cath labs uh, because it, it will give you significant advantages in crossing CTOs. And it's true, actually, what you just saw right now is, is reproducible most of the time. Excellent work, uh, George. So this is an 018 uh, support catheter behind that wire, or sorry, I didn't hear that part. It is, it is an 018-150-CXC, and I've injected through um, to show that we are true lumen. Um, so if you can give me that run-through wire quick. I'm going to take the run-through wire, and we're going to place it at the level of the mid-perineal. Again, right now, Jihad, I've given five cc's of dye in terms to Larry's comment early. Earlier, I'm being very conscientious of how much dye I've given. Have not taken a scalp film on this, uh, on this um, run so far. So, George, as you advance the wire, I'm going to I'm gonna ask Dr. Conti. Dr. Conti, this is a, a patient with a single vessel runoff distally. And you know, we still have to think about all the options. What do you think about a uh, fem pop bypass for a patient who's 80, in the 80s with a renal function as such? Well, he's not a low risk patient, no matter what you do. It sounds like the wound is potentially in the border shed between the perineal and the anterior tibial distribution. I'd probably be happy if I could get that perineal artery to look a little bit better uh, uh, going down to the lower, to the ankle. So I didn't get a good look at it, but it looks like there's some disease in that perineal. Um, it's hard to know if he's a bypass candidate, but I think with a relatively short SFA occlusion, possibly just getting that open and then busting up the perineal might be a place to start. Oh, great, thank you. And uh, Dr. Dr. Conti, we agree with you, and that's our plan. George, good morning. This is Fadi. Um, I have a question for you. So how? Uh, How does uh, the speed or, or the ease of crossing or relative ease of crossing uh, a lesion interferes in your decision-making process in terms of delivering therapy? Great. That's a great question. So you're talking about plaque morphology, um, Fatty, and we're going to show you what the plaque morphology is in a second because the concern is, is there thrombus in there? Is there um, some other plaque morphology, heterogeneous calcific plaque, et cetera? So we're going to do an IVIS of this in a second just to... Um, show you uh, what the morphology of the plaque is and, and would it change our decision making? George, uh, I just want to bring to the audience a very important step that you just made. Uh, you probably want, you were going to talk about it, but you got distracted. So you notice when George crossed with an 18 gram tip wire, yeah. got to where he needs to get to go, and then switched to a run through wire as he went down this little below the knee. Uh, and uh, George, do, do you want to elaborate on your thought process to why you switch to a run-through wire and not continue with the wire that you had in, in the first place? 
great jihad. So it's, a, it's an aggressive wire. An 18 gram wire, of course, is an aggressive wire. The run through is a less aggressive. The last thing I want to do is get in a branch um, or some other uh, vessel and, and cause a problem with the uh, CTO wire. So please take the time and, and shift from a high gram tip wire to a soft tip wire oh, after you cross your CTO yeah. to avoid any distal uh, unnecessary complications. This is an excellent. Um, the thing is, uh, despite the fact that there is um, a renal insufficiency, he's taking the time in the SFA and the perineal to make sure he's in true lumen, just not uh, accepting it on angiographic pictures. That's uh, really important to confirm that you're really in true lumen before offering therapy. Sachi, that uh, angiogram looks fish. really good. What, what do you think the size of that uh, perineal artery? It's a great question, Jihad. Are you asking me or are you asking the group? Uh, no, I asked you proofly for your partner there. I know what uh, you're going to oh, say. Yeah, you're going to say it's yeah, probably it's, it's two it's millimeter, a... but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a perineal, and we all, uh, always uh, underestimate it. So it's probably about a two and a half millimeter I vessel. Uh, it's a pretty large vessel uh, for a perineal. Um, but uh, to the same point, he's going to take the time to IVIS, the SFA and the perineal, to, um, to look for plaque morphology uh, as well as... Um, the size of the vessel as well, so we won't be left guessing. But it's probably about two and a half to three. Hey, George. Yeah. Now, Jihad. For, yeah. Yes, sir. No, go ahead, George. So what I was saying is what, what I've done is I've been exchanged. So I, I confirm placement that I'm in the perineal. I've done two shots with dye, five cc's each. So, so far, I've used about 10 cc's of dye. Um, I've got an 014, 014 wire in place. It's the Viper. Remember, there are two types of Viper wires you can use. One's an 014, 014 tipped. The other one's an 014, 017 tipped. The reason I'd use an 014, 017 is if I was going to place a filter. If okay. you're going to use a filter in this, uh, in this scenario, you'd use a NAV6, a free-floating filter. So George, now we're going in with intravascular. Yeah, go ahead. Excellent thought process, George. And I appreciate you mentioning that you need to put a, a tapered up wire uh, if you're going to put a filter, especially the NAV6 filter. Uh, otherwise, they do tend to come off and uh, stay behind. George, we're really curious to see when you take the IVIS in, what is the size of the uh, perineal artery in the mid portion? And what is uh, the size at the junction between the perineal and the TPT? My suspicion, my suspicion is that the uh, perineal artery is going to be much larger than 2.5, and the TPT is going to be probably larger than um, 2.5 or 3. And it, it's going to be a nice thing to show our audience here that um, tibial vessels are bigger than what we give them. You know, George, I'm also curious. This is Tom Davis. I, I'm curious. Uh, hey, angiography, I think, is very poor for distinguishing what calcium is in deep walled, superficial, what have you. But I think the, uh, the, the wire you've chosen, to, the, especially the uh, heavier gram tips, really give you a good feedback and you get an idea of what, what that uh, vessel is. And I think you have to use all your information. Uh, here you're going to have IVIS, which is going to make it simple for you. But when you were going down there with that wire, if you had to guess, what, what, what did that lesion feel like? Did, did you think you, you went down through it so quickly? Did you think there was a lot of calcium that you were going through? Did you feel like it was thrombus? Did you feel like it was just soft plaque? Or what, what was your take on when you were wiring that? It's a great question, Tom. And to be honest with you, it fooled me a little bit um, because it was relatively easy. I can tell you the tip of the wire when I was tapping the sides was, was a little harder, but the wire did go pretty freely. So it would make me think that on the spectrum of things, it's more on a homogenous, heterogeneous type of platform rather than completely calcific. George, can you, can you, you split the, the screen to show us where you are, fluoroscopy, in terms of the sure. IVIS? Oh, I'm sorry, it's on the left Ab side. Absolutely. If we can, yep. Can you show me over here? Can you show me the IVIS? Where is it? The IVIS catheter. I know we're in the tibia. George, tibias. while you're doing that, and a uh, question to George and the panel. Uh, uh, thoughts on embolic protection. You have uh, SFA stenosis, which, may, which seems to be a little bit soft. You have a okay, single vessel runoff, perineal disease. Uh, we're going to be using atherectomy. What are your thoughts on embolic protection here? So embolic protection. So if we decided that um, by the IVIS it was more of a soft plaque, I would encourage us to put embolic protection down when using the, if we're, for the SFA, for sure, considering we have one vessel runoff. Um, and that would necessitate changing the wire then? That would okay. necessitate George, can you, changing can the can wire. you please take the IVIS down a little bit further down to the uh, mid-perineal, to the, to the normal yep, segment? Yeah, you betcha. 
Thank you, George. So we are in mid, about mid-perineal right now, Jihad. Okay. Okay. So can we go ahead and push a play? We're going to record this uh, from here back. And what I did, Jihad, when I was going down, just to, I know the size of the vessels. I know where the snow seas are. So I just advanced the ivis on down. Um, so we're coming back through the mid-perineal. You know, the other thing, too, is I think that uh, uh, when you're starting to use IVUS like this, uh, radiation, it, we, we're conscious about how much dye we use, but we, we really need to be conscious of radiation, too, with, with all the uh, health effects both for us and the patients and, and people in our lab. So I think, you know, Jihad, you'd ask them to go down a little bit further to the mid-perineal, but, you know, you, uh, we, we had to see areas that was not diseased on that IVUS. We really didn't need to throw on the pedal to know where we were at. If we were in a non-disease segment, we kind of knew how big that perineal was going to be downstream then. And uh, especially when we're, we're putting those ivises down there, I think we got to pay more attention to the ivis and the radiation there. Uh, exposure of what we're getting on the uh, fluoroscopy. Yeah. Great. A great point, Tom. And that's what I tried to use when I was going down, just the size of the vessel. And so I'm pulling back through the pop now. I think everybody could appreciate that there was some tight lesions, heterogeneous calcific plaque in the TP trunk and perineal. Um, and in a second after we're done, we'll actually size the vessel. Uh, the mid-perineal, I think uh, Ravish was correct. It was about a 2.5 centimeter vessel, but we'll, we'll measure it. Do you happen to have virtual histology I mean, on millimeter. Your, your IVUS here? George? We do have virtual histology, but um, why are you asking for virtual histology? I'm just curious the uh, composition of the plaque based on that, what you had. Sure. The data has been sort of controversial in terms of using virtual histology for plaque composition, but uh, you're much more of an expert than me, Tom. Um, I'm still in the pop, distal SFA. Should be coming up on this mid SFA in a second. Hey, George, uh, talking about strategies to reduce contrast and radiation. Are. are you guys um, using external ultrasound in these kind of cases uh, to guide your wire uh, or to reduce the radiation and contrast? We aren't. Um, you know, we don't have the same capabilities as Jihad. Uh, you know, having a technician that's um, as versed as him. Actually, the best technician I have is in your audience right now. Um, but uh, we typically don't. Wow, George, really impressed with the amount of calcium that uh, you have to deal here with. Here you go. Mm -hmm. And here we, it's there's the stenosis, Jihad. So I think everybody can appreciate that there's a calcified rim you can see from the vessel. It's heterogeneous plaque, it looks as if, um, with some specks of calcium throughout it. Um, um, it's completely occlusive. I think everybody can appreciate that. Can you press record again? We just ran out of our time. Sarah, or, or Heather, yeah, just push record one more time. Go home. But importantly, it does not look uh, like there's thrombus in there, uh, which is a concern given how easily it went through, but it's soft plaque, heterogeneous. And the, the, that plaque seems uh, a fairly stable plaque, but I think there's a portion in there right towards the beginning of your occlusion which has some mobility, which probably is a the final common pathway of thrombosis there. You can stop it. Can you give me a size on the perineal, the first image where we started, and then a size right here? So Heather's going to do a favor for us. She's going to measure the, the diameters of both the uh, native SFA proximal to the lesion as well as the perineal for jihad. That's great, George. Uh, so, So, Jihad, the other thing is Renu Vermanis has shown us very eloquently that a lot of these CTOs have some thrombus in it through her pathology. Um, from the panel standpoint, does that change your opinion in terms of the device strategy we use? You know, probably before I, uh, we did the study with Vermani, maybe I would have, but one of the things that she showed me in, in the recent studies that we, we did together, uh, some of the, this thrombus is so sticky with, with the amount of the uh, fiber and deposit in it. I, you know, I personally just when I hear the word thrombus, I tend to be a little bit shy from putting aggressive tools in there. Um, the fact that you put a distal protection device, I feel a little bit more at ease that um, feel free to use anything you want to. But one, at one point here, um, if it wasn't for the heterogeneous uh, density deposit in the plaque, which is consistent with calcium, 
I probably would not have used uh, Diamondback. Maybe I would have used uh, Jetstream. Okay, great. But hey, J um, Jihad, I, have, I do not have a distal protection device in currently, just to make that clear. Um, strictly a wire. So, again, does that change your mindset on the device I use? You know, this distally, George, especially the TPT perineal, absolutely, uh, orbital atherectomy has got to be used there. It's a, a perfect setup for that. In the SFA, uh, I agree with Lawrence. There's something mobile there. Um, I, I think there's a component an of there? a structured organized thrombus. I probably would be less um, uh, aggressive in using orbital atherectomy in that segment. So the question here, would you use two? atherectomy devices, or we just treat the SFA different than you treat the TPT and the perineal, and you've got to treat both of them. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Dr. So, Conti, what do you um, think of that when you saw the proximal SFA uh, IVUS? There, there was a mobile segment there consistent with possible organized thrombus. The, the, the thought was, George, uh, one of the audience members asked about just simple aspiration of the SFA. Uh, to avoid having to do two different types of devices. The problem yeah. is usually that, that like is, uh, is very organized, and whatever aspiration catheter that you use, it, it, it's not going to be it's not going to be effective. You know, I think that the the real question here is uh, if you truly believe that this is m more embolic because it does have thrombus in it, uh, or at least the potential is raised there, uh, then I think distal protection hey, makes perfect heaven. sense with single Give vessel runoff. Give me a nav six. Ultimately, the device viper. that you want to choose then. I think is, you know, ease of use, uh, Ravish, again, you're despite talking our sponsor, setup an you could probably get the, put an the proximal yeah. TP trunk. We'll you switch don't have this to out. use two devices from yeah. Pathway. Yeah. You have to use so the let's um, proximal device switch this being out. bigger. So I need the uh, cross I mean, the, other, the other option here, you know, we don't do a lot of IVUS, so we kind of, it looked calcified, it was a CTO, we go by the clinical picture and where we are, but, you know, if it crossed that easily and now we see this mobile thing, the other thing you could do is put a distal protection device, use a balloon, low pressure, just see what the, you know, the, the um, compliance is. Uh, and then see what you have after that. So, George, I am going to challenge you to make a decision and finish this in 23 minutes. No pressure. We will finish it in 23 minutes. So what we're doing here, so, um, so Jihad, this is a very important um, topic. I would like to poll the panel and ask them how many of them use intravascular ultrasound. And then you may want to poll the audience because this has changed what our treatment is. I can tell you that I did a, sh a small study with about 50 patients and using intravascular ultrasound changed my decision, whether it be uh, atherectomy device, size of the balloon, size of the stent, about 40% of the time. Well, so you, this is uh, a very important topic. I'll get you the audience. In the audience, how many of you would have used an IVUS in this case? Oh, George, only a couple. Oops. How about the panel? That's Who right. would have used an IVUS in this so. case? hardly ever do. I no one, George. So, yeah. but that, but that was a good idea, man. We give you credit for doing this. <laughs> yeah. So, Jihad, let me just put well, it out there. So, peripheral IBIS is not terribly well reimbursed. So, uh, I mean, that's also part of the par uh, problem here. Um, I think it provides great information. Uh, I think George just proved that it provides great information. We always go in with one idea and have to pop off to a second idea. But, um, you know, when it, costs, it comes to cost containment, I think that's also part of the the metric. Yeah. But clinically, the, fa the fact that, uh, you know, uh, what this case demonstrates, and I think it's very important, is that the decision-making process, I think it's always hard not to do something versus doing something. So the operator will go in, all of us will go in, 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 in a case with a, with a certain mindset, with a certain thought process, especially an 89-year-old, uh, you know, advanced chronic kidney disease patient, and, and then going through the motion of deciding, well, may not be a good idea to use what I wanted to do in the first place. I mean, I think this is a perfect example where you took out the not wire use something or not use something. took out device. the wire. George, what is, that, uh, what is that white thing that you just wiped the wire with? That's not a 4 by so 4 this is, so, so this is pretty novel. So this is called a swiper. Um, so it's, what we've shown, and Renew's done some research with this as well, is that, that your typical 4 by 4 gauze uh, leaves debris, seen in the carotid, seen in the coronary, seen in the periphery. This is a, um, a foam substance that does not leave debris on the wire or on devices. It's called the swiper. I see. Is it's uh, made by intervention. The Dr. Vermani did a study on distal beds and she found that there is significant debris sent to the distal bed from wires and balloons. And this is the same one? Same swiper? That is correct. Correct. There, that is. 
amazing amount of data as to what we're leaving behind now in the yeah. bloodstream. Uh, these little I think that's buckets good. we don't have behind us really either. Put the, look at the, the gauze in or whatever. Just I leaves a ton of debris, which gets just leave it right uh, there. readmitted it's a large. to the patient. Might as well take it, it down further. So yeah. protection for the... Go what we Renew, what sure they were talking about, Renew has shown a, a tremendous amount of inflammatory response to the uh, gauze debris that, uh, yeah. and towel debris that we in, inadvertently place yeah. uh, in the well, patient with uh, cases. Device. It's just uh, Say again. It's natural. And this, this newer device, device we'll take it doesn't, yeah. the, the debris that's left behind is minimal. So, George, so given Jihad, your uh, inability to finish this quickly, I just begged to get you some more airtime, and we're able to get you a few more minutes. All right, you betcha. We're going to finish in time, Jihad, so you better just hold on to that seat. But we've got an 014017 <laughs> wire in place, um, and we've got, a, um, we've got a NAV6 filter in place now. Um, we're deploying the NAV6. I think everybody can see that on your screen, I hope. Um, and now no, what George, we're going to no, do we is don't we're going to can, can you please mag magnify it more so we can see it? I really want, want the audience to see you deploying this. This is a phenomenal point. So this is where I've deployed it. Um, it's a NAV6. Uh, it's a free-floating filter. You cannot use a filter that is attached to the wire. This is the only filter that is free-floating in the U.S. that we can use. Um, it's a large NAV6. Uh, place it level the mid-pop. Thank you, George. That looks great. Can we get that balloon? And do you always put it balloon? in a P3 segment, George, or there's no, just you put it where you need to put it if you're working in an SFA? So distal to the lesion, of course, but the P3 segment, I believe, is a good place to put it to protect the tibials. Great. George, as you get ready for your next step, can you just go over the next steps for you? If you're going to put a distal protection device as you have at the joint space uh, and you have to work distally, uh, what's your retrieval process and how do you maintain wire position as you come back? Great. That's a great point. So that's the nice thing about the NAV6 um, is that it's free floating. So what you would do is you take a crossing cat or a uh, retrieval catheter and retrieve the filter uh, but, and pull back the 017 tip to pull the uh, filter into the retrieval catheter. And then once we've done that, then I'm going to do my best to leave that wire in place, pull the filter out in the uh, captured catheter. Um, so that we don't lose light wire position. We're going in with a 5060 um, 018 cook balloon currently. Mag us out to about 14. I'm going to take another angiogram. Hey, George, there's something I heard. It's called measuring tape. Sometimes you can put on a lesion so you can mark where you are, where you need to be. That might help uh, you. Measure and tape. See, <laughs> <laughs> is that what they have in Michigan? They, we have that in Michigan. <laughs> All right, so here's our uh, CTO. We've done well so far. I've given about 20 cc's a die so far. Um, so I think that's respectable, even though I don't have your measuring <laughs> tape. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mark this for us. Yep, great. I'm going to take the balloon down to where it is. So, George, you're going to go ahead and balloon this uh, right now? I am. I am. I'm going to balloon, and then we're going to stint it. Um, I'm thinking about using a drug-eluting stint after this, and then we're going to go address the distal circulation. Again, Jihide, the intravascular ultrasound has changed my opinion on how I would have initially addressed this because I think it's a great point. You got to do the right thing. It's a soft plaque, going up to eight, please. Um, uh, and I think this is the safest thing for the patient. So George, We're going to go I, to eight atmospheres. I really commend your thought process. So the reason you, sh I saw that you shifted quickly to the IVIS after you crossed. So did it cross your mind when you, when you crossed that easy that there might have been some soft uh, plaque in there? Is that what happened? Absolutely, and Tom, I think, hit the nail on the head. When he saw my wire easily go through there, because I thought this would have been a little bit more difficult, it makes me think that it's soft plaque. Great. I thought it was either that oh, or uh, those glasses that you have that uh, have some special magnification or visualization. <laughs> you know, Tom. Well, well they are special big, glasses. They, they, they do have that. Don't be fooled. <laughs> so, Tom, you're a big All Ibis right. user in your site. 
Uh, if, if this has happened in your site and you went through it very easily, okay. would you IVS it or just you proceed with uh, doing any form of therapy? Because I'm sorry, say it again. So you're, you're a big IVS user. So if you cross that easy in your site, same lesion, would you go ahead on IVIS or would you just proceed with any form of therapy? I would probably just have uh, proceeded because I, I think, uh, at least from what I saw there, well, and, and I think the operator is the one that has to be able to tell with the, their tactile 80. feel. But my suspicion was that that was not just going to be uh, a very heavily calcified, we don't have longer than 80, hard do we? plaque. Uh, I thought it would have been much softer or at least maybe have some throm thrombotic so, material. So I probably would have just went to that. Uh, so so uh, for our audience, you know, I hear the question often here is which atherectomy device for which lesion? So for this specific on, lesion, Tom, which atherectomy device would have been a perfect atherectomy device Silver if you would use one? Uh, I mean, I think for this, for the bigger, for bigger vessels, I think uh, a pathway is a rotational aspiration is a good device for this. Um, I, I think uh, directional would be yeah, with a filter don't pull that because filter. I think this would have mobile plaque elements. And, and that's why I like to think about these, whether they're, they're what I think that they're going to be more mobile than not, mm -hmm. um, where I think uh, thrombotic material, calcified material, those things I think are going to be more embolic, thrombotic, or mobile. And um, that's where I would use something to that degree, especially with a filter if I was going to use directional. Um, you know, I think on the IVUS, which is interesting too, the, uh, on, on fluoroscopy, you see this as a very, very heavily calcified vessel. It looks to be that way. On IVUS, it, it had more of that Mockenberg uh, type look to it. And what's interesting is on, on IVUS, when you see this more deep wall calcium, you don't get that black fallout beyond there. Because actually, the, the ultrasound waves, the, the calcium is not as dense. And so you'll see beyond it in the ultrasound. There's some areas, though, that you do see a black fallout where it's more uh, uh, not this Mockenberg, not the deep cal small calcium. So I think that that was uh, something that was more distinct to me as well on the IVUS. Pravish, what do you think? You're probably not going to be reaching that. You're probably not going to be modifying that, was a that, 680. that much yeah. with that. So, uh, you know, uh, Art, in, in our patient lab, in, in the same scenario right here, uh, if you were to stent this, uh, which stent would you go to, no, given in the literature that was discussed yesterday and all the data that we saw, which stent would you go to um, in this setting? Um, you know, I guess the choices we have are either like a Zilver PTX um, stent or we use the Zilver. Um, you know, we like to do PTX, especially here with a patient with CLI, uh, and then focus on the downstream stuff especially with the creatinine being high and not wanting to come back and do repeat procedures. My only concern would be, you know, if there is some sort of subacute or acute story to it and there's thrombus there, mm -hmm. it's not, as far as I'm concerned, I'm aware of it's not been studied in that situation. Yeah. So is there more hyper, you know, coagulability or something with the medicated stent? I'm not sure. That would be my only, uh, you know, trepidation. You, you, really, you really bring a great point. Uh, so this is a patient, elderly patient with renal insufficiency with CLI. Do everything that you can so to, to prevent uh, this patient coming back again. You happy with it? So, George, we, we, we are in total agreement with you in what you're doing. Just, just to add to the data set, okay. you know, the, uh, the uh, Zilver data at four years, you five centimeter metric, really Got it right below the collateral like this, uh, but thing it looks they good. just recently presented their data out of Japan, um, about a 11 centimeter metric. Yeah, I think about 44% had renal insufficiency to renal failure, and all were heavily calcified. And they had a primary patency at, I think they're out at one year, was what the PCR data was, uh, of about still 84%. So I think the Zilver, at least in this, in this area, despite the thrombus, uh, I'm not sure about the acuity here, but just despite the thrombus, uh, still has some reasonably good data out of Zilver PTX. So I think it's still a reasonably good and actually probably the best choice. Well, I have a question for okay, the rest of the panel and George, too. Would drug code of balloon, when we have it, be uh, your choice here, or would you still stent? You know, when he did the IVIS, actually, that, that's, of course, uh, that crossed my mind immediately. Uh, the amount of um, plaque between the center of the vessel and the media, the distance seems so far. Um, you know, we'll see what the um, Latonix ISR are going to show, but probably I would have debulked before I used the quarter balloon in this Let's scenario here. Let's hit it. We don't know we the answer, Tom. To Hopefully, we'll distal. get some more data. Do you want to post dilate? Uh, Do you want to post dilate? Yeah. So, well, George, I'm, I, I, I am very disappointed in you right now. Uh, sure, the proximal stent does not look very well prepared, prepped, George. 
You're making us all look bad. What are you talking about? Oh, gosh. <laughs> you can't even see it, can you? I'm sorry, guys. So, you know, so, uh, vessel look. prep is when you really have a nice lay layout, oh, no saying. residual <laughs> stenosis like you see here in a proximal stand. And then you uh, deploy a stand. Yeah, well, I think down. this is the perfect spot for Ivis right now <coughs> um, because he's got it out there. He can actually put that back down there, take a look at it, see what his uh, inflow looks like, what his outflow looks like. I'm concerned about the outflow still, uh, especially in this segment uh, of the SFA. So I think, I, I think this is where Ivis is probably yeah. somewhat useful. We use it in the coronaries for this situation. And I think we probably should be using it in the, in the periphery as well, too, to see if we have the stents adequately deployed, uh, approximately distally covered. and So I, I think this may be where Ivis is uh, useful. Hey, George, is that a Viper wire that you're playing with down there? It is. And as you know, Jihad, it's not the most benign wire, and it doesn't give you good tactile sensation. For the sake of time, I'm going to um, go to the outflow and uh, diamondback atherectomize, and then we'll balloon once we do that, um, and then balloon coming out to prep your vessel a little bit better. Um, you know, you know, George, I, I, hate to, I hate to say this to you, but look, if, if I was in your situation right now and this is a Viper wire that was pulled back, I would not actually try to maneuver the Viper wire. I would exchange over an 018 catheter, take a soft wire down like you did earlier, and then exchange. It takes two minutes, but it's definitely worth every second of it. And, and the reason I say that for the audience is because this wire is not really very finessable. It does torque well, but it's very aggressive tip. And all you need is lift up a plaque here or dissect, and then uh, you go from a single vessel runoff to none in a matter of seconds. So George here is most likely going to um, go to a catheter and softer wire to re-engage the distal uh, perineal. Especially because you don't have a total occlusion down there that you're dealing with. You know, you, you, it's not like you're going to worry about recrossing this with a softer wire. So I think that's a great idea just because it'll save you time down the road in many cases. Yeah. So, so, Tom, the proximal uh, stent, the proximal portion of the stent that you saw earlier, I know you don't do a lot of stent. Um, and then, uh, Lawrence, you, you actually discussed that a lot in, uh, throughout the country. What would you have done to that proximal stent portion? I would have, I would have uh, debulked and, and ballooned it. Um, I think for, for CLI... This is pulling the filter the, the, back the, into the catheter. I think the CLI, the, the important part is down below the knee more so. Um, and, and we certainly know from uh, limb salvage and, and uh, that, that the patency is not, uh, you know, the long-term patency is not predictive of wound healing. And uh, you still have a nice profunda there, which is, uh, I didn't, uh, when I was looking through there, it looked like the profunda was okay. So you still have a, uh, a great source of uh, proximal blood supply in the profunda, even so. Uh, I think this, this use our cross the knee disease minutes. is really what's, it's going to be the important aspect for limb salvage or, or see, wound see healing. So, so, yeah, I, I definitely would have debulked, I think, and ballooned at that point in time. Yeah. So, so Jihad, real quickly, I've left my wire in place. I've removed the filter. Um, just, I think, as Larry asked me earlier, I'm going to use an 018 uh, CXC, switch out for a benign wire. Place it distally, switch out for the 014014 Viper, atherectomize, and balloon.